dramatic. Nothing personal word of the day. It is Thursday, August 25th, 2022. Live from Miami Beach here at the Cleveland Earth, the Levitard Studios. My word is dramatic. I like to save that word. I don't like, right, there's drama in high school between kids or middle school and there's drama with your friends, there's drama at work. Drama is a word that's used, to me it's a great movie, right? Is that a comedy, horror movie? Is it science fiction? No, this is a drama. That means I'm gonna be touched emotionally or I'm gonna have to think on certain topics. I may learn something. I may watch great interplay between groups of people. This is so dramatic. Will Evil Knievel make it over the mountain? That's such an old example. I'm sorry, Coca. Four, six, nine. Dramatic. Who will win the next presidential race? There's great drama. Lawsuits can be dramatic. But I don't like overusing the word. The reason I'm using it as the word of the day is that MLB made an announcement yesterday and they let Chris Marinak announce it. Chris Marinak is the chief operating officer and strategy officer of MLB. He is looked at as potentially the next commissioner and worthy of that. He is someone I worked with right when he was starting. He is tremendously smart, capable, and now he's getting some announcements, which is great. And he is a just a very good critical thinker. And MLB announced their schedule. Did you catch it? Because they don't really do a whole, they leak out a few games, a few times, a few interesting things. They, again, they so badly want to be the NFL, but they're not when it comes to schedule. But finally, this year, there was a big change. And so MLB decided, let's make this sort of a big deal. Let's release the schedule. We're going to have some quotes on it. And then we're going to explain to people all these big differences, even though they leaked before. Sort of like when games in the NFL leak, who's playing who, who your opponents are. You've got the following seven opponents at home, but we don't know what day. We know what day, we don't know what time. We know what time, we don't know what location. Are you gonna be in London? Are you gonna be in the four o'clock slot? Are you gonna be flexed to Saturday? Those don't count until late late in the season when the broadcasters decide. But it's, it's a thing. Everyone gets excited, like the college football schedule. That always makes me laugh, that's very dramatic. There's been an agreement between Alabama and Wisconsin Obviously, I'm making this up because I don't know and I don't care. But there's been an agreement between Alabama and Wisconsin that they will play a back-to-back home-and-home series in 2048 and 49. Are you kidding me? But everyone, breaking news on CBS. Huge scheduling of Ohio State and UCLA in 2060. Hey, we're going to bring in an college football analyst, and we're going to talk about it. Yes, the math is the starting quarterback on that team. His parents have not even been born. (laughs) So ridiculous. So MLB releases the schedule yesterday, and no one cares, but you're going to care when I tell you a couple things that are funny. It's now what's called a balanced schedule. We use that word inside of the industry. An unbalanced schedule is what we've had, which means you play every team in your division, let's say 18 or 19 times. Well, we don't have to let's say it, that's what the number is. Then you play a home and home against everyone else in your league. And then you play a certain division in the other league. So let's pretend this was the year that the NL East plays the AL East. Then that would be The Marlins would either play the Yankees at home or the Yankees on the road. And we'd wait for the schedule. We'd call up the commissioner and say, really, we really want to host the Yankees because we think that will help attendance. So if you could give it to us on weekdays, that would be great because on a weekend, we already get bigger attendance on a weekend. This is not just what the Marlins think. This is what every team thinks. You actually go to baseball and you fill out a form over a year in advance, not just of which holidays you don't want to play on or what you have, certain blackout dates during the course of your season because you're hosting Guns N' Roses or whatever you're doing, or Billy Joel or whatever, so you have to be on the road for a particular number of days for load in, and then a particular number of days for load out, yada, yada. And then you say, 
and we want to host the Yankees. Every team says it, and we're the same small revenue teams who are MFing the Yankees and the Dodgers for everything they do to screw us, but then we're sending secret memos. Dear Bud, at the time it was Katie Feeney who worked for, may she rest in peace, who worked for Bud Selig, who was in charge of the schedule, which was so archaic, it was just funny. But don't tell anyone, but we really want to host the Yankees. And by the way, that Cubs series, you got to move that one to a weekend because we're doing all these budgets and we're calculating where we can charge the highest prices, where we can make the most money, where we can try to lose less money, yada, yada, yada. Balanced schedule. But it's not that fair because when you play people in your division so many times, like you can beat up all the crappy teams. Think about the NL Central and how much fun it is to play the Cubs and the Pirates and the Reds every single day. Or think about in the NL East how exciting it is to pay, play the Nationals or the Marlins or the Marlins to play the Nationals. Like the Marlins are 12 and 1 against the Nationals and their record is 54 and 70 or 54 and 71, right? So all of those teams that we would calculate, oh this is great before the season starts, here's our path to the division. We know the Orioles are going to stink, not this year. So if we're the Blue Jays, we say to ourselves, we've got 19 games against the Blue Jays. We've got to go 14 and 5 or better. That gets us nine over immediately. We believe we're going to have to win 90 games to get be a wild card, which means we've got to be, just call it 18 games over 500. We have to be nine games over for the rest of the, the, the rest of the games and we'll calculate which series we think we're gonna win, where we're gonna split. We do all this before a season starts and try to map out where we're gonna be. No, we don't do the simulator and that 10,000 simulations. 5,000 times you'll win 14 out of 19 against the Orioles, but the other 5,000, you'll only win 10. Oh crap, what do we do? <laughs> we don't really do that. So that's the unbalanced schedule. This year, it's big news balanced schedule. Every team will play every team in all of baseball. This is the beginning of getting rid of the American League and the National League. This is the beginning of radical realignment. This is the beginning of expansion. Mark down the day. August 25th, 2022 is when the baseball world changed as you know it. That's dramatic, but that wasn't announced. Just the new schedule. Listen to this quote. It's pretty good. This was written for Chris by the PR people but I just want to read you part of the quote. It's pretty good. The new balance schedule will feature all 30 clubs playing each other for at least one series in 2023. True. That's great. This new format creates more consistent opponent matchups as clubs compete for postseason bursts. That's for the owners because owners would complain like it's not fair, like an interleague that the Tampa Rays get to play the Marlins when the Marlins were bad, but yet you've got the Red Sox who have to play the Braves. And they'd say, why do the Red Sox play? Why is that their natural rivalry? Boston and Atlanta. And Tampa and, and Miami, we used to do this grapefruit series thing where if you won the series between Tampa and Miami, you got like a bag of grapefruits. It was so asinine, but it always felt good. We always tried to beat Tampa because why not? But natural rivalries, I wouldn't say the Rays and Marlins have this great historical rivalry. Additionally, and this is when it gets good. In a statement releasing the schedule when you know you haven't really succeeded in doing anything to get the NFL off the front page, make it short, make it sweet, send it out and let individual teams sort of send out what they want. He wrote, additionally, this fan-friendly format provides fans with the opportunity to see more opponent matchups with a particular focus on dramatically expanding our most exciting interleague matchups. I'm not sure how that is. And offers more, here it is, national exposure to the star players throughout the game. Stay tuned for next Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN. It's the Yankees versus the Red Sox. Stay tuned next week. We've got the Yankees against the Dodgers. Stay tuned next week. We've got the Red Sox against the Dodgers. How many times have you seen Julio Rodriguez? Who? Yeah, that rookie 
for Seattle. Just hit his 20th home run. Yeah, I think they've been on Sunday Night Baseball quite a bit, haven't they? What about Jazz Chisholm? What about Sandy Alcantara? You seen him? Cy Young Award winner? Likely Cy Young Award winner? Nothing? No? It made me crazy. And baseball would always blame ESPN and the other networks. Yeah, they just, they want the Yankees and the Red Sox. It's what they want. They don't really want Miami. Aren't you trying to promote some of our players? We have some of the best players in the game. Don't you want to give Stanton a bigger stage? How would you not want to promote Jose or Ugla? How about Cody Ross for crying out loud? Offering more national exposure to the star players throughout our game. Give me a break. Let me see the national matchups. But they did put in the release some good news for you. Everybody's playing on opening day. <laughs> Can you believe what it's come to? Can you imagine like on week one, the NFL said, yeah, we're going to give a bye to a team on week one. That's what it is when MLB gives an off day on opening day to a team. It's ridiculous. But this year, they're not going to do it. And if you want to keep track, we've got games in London. That'll be good. We've got games on Jackie Robinson Day. That's always good. You can never tell who's who. Everyone's wearing the same number. Got games on Lou Gehrig Day celebrating. Ce I don't like that. We're not celebrating Lou Gehrig's Day. We're trying to raise awareness for ALS. Roberto Clemente Day. That's a good one. So many days. It's a lot of days. Do you know what? Do you know why we do so many days? They. God, that's a dollar coca. Do you know why they do so many days? It's different jerseys, different hats. We have a Father's Day hat, a Mother's Day hat, a July 4th hat, a September 11th hat, a Clemente hat, a Jackie Robinson hat, a uniform, money. Get into our merchandise store. We got days. It's dramatic. How excited are you for the 2023 schedule? Next. When you draft a player, sorry, I need to take a bigger pause there, Coca. I agree. That's a tough transition. So we'll finish. Dramatic word of the day, August 25th, 2022. Let's let it breathe. Do a little three count in my head without saying it into the microphone. Like four, six, nine. I don't even remember what the next topic is now. I can't do it. I don't like the pauses like that. All right, all right, I got it, I got it. Here we go. Okay. Dramatic. Is this dramatic? What the hell is he talking about? I have no idea. It's a Thursday. I'm tired. I mean, you can't stay up late talking on the phone and then wake up early and commute 54 minutes into a studio in the dark with only one person here. Thank God Bob was here. No idea what I'd do. Stu Gott sure as hell wasn't here. So when you draft a player, I've thought about this a lot, especially now is the time in baseball where teams are figuring out which players are going to let play winter ball. That's like uh, for younger players, you want to get more at-bats to. Some veteran players play winter ball in the Dominican or Puerto Rico because they want to try to get another shot. They're trying to get an invite to spring training. There are scouts who go watch these games. There are rules that if you have a young player who has played a certain number of games, has a certain number of at-bats, a certain number of innings pitched, you don't have to let them play winter ball. And then the players get angry with you. And then the countries get angry with you because they want their players, their native sons coming home. It's a whole Megillah. And I've always thought about it because the risk is injury. And my issue with players getting injured during the off season is that it's such a grind, the baseball season. I'd rather the players relax and then start their throwing programs and then start swinging the bat somewhere around you know, post Thanksgiving, maybe a little more toward Christmas and then ramp up and get ready for spring training. Basketball to me has always been more interesting because these players to me play 12 months. They're doing all through the season, a long season. The playoffs start in April. Many players are playing through June. And then before you know it, there's a summer league, which is mostly players not on active rosters. But then you've got farm born players who go play for their countries. All these things are going on. And now there's even more stuff. I, I saw LeBron James playing in like a, a pro-am game. And I remember thinking to myself, this is very bizarre. He's old, right? Why is he doing this? There's nothing good that can come of it. 
it didn't even occur to me that a different player, a newly drafted player, could get hurt. And I found out about it because of one of you. You know what I want? I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Get in my Twitter. Get inside my Twitter, David P. Samson. Ask me a question on DM. I'm having a harder time keeping up, Coke. I can't promise that I will respond to everyone or that I'll see everyone. I guess that's the sign that things are going well for us. If you were president of the Oklahoma City Thunder, would you have let Chet Holmgren play in the game with LeBron? I saw that question, and what did I do? I went to the Google. I was not aware that Mike Holgram's grandson was playing in a game with LeBron James. And then I said, well, wait a minute. That's that tall, skinny guy that we talked about who got drafted by the Thunder. He's supposed to be good. What what happened to him? Oh, no. He played in that Pro-Am game. He's guarding LeBron James. And all of a sudden, he gets hurt. And he could be out. He suffered this injury like two minutes into a game. I wasn't even aware of what was going on uh, in terms of what LeBron was doing and sort of sponsoring this game or appearing in this game. And then it got worse. There's a former, I think, Bull and Nick guy named Jamal Crawford. And he he's the one who hosted this and, and came up with this pro-am idea. Holmgren's in there. And he's guarding LeBron in transition, which he shouldn't be doing. He's a seven foot skinny guy. So he's guarding him. And then for whatever reason, he landed on his foot, his ankle, his knee. And then before you know it, the game got canceled. Jamal Crawford, as the commissioner of this, canceled the game. He said, I had to make the decision to stop the game to protect the players. Tough but right decision. Jason Tatum was playing in this game. Yes, the Celtics guy who's going to be traded along with Jalen Brown for Kevin Durant. Remember that from yesterday? Apparently there was condensation or flooding or leaking or wetness. And maybe they didn't have the guys where every, you see them in every league and NBA game. You know, the guys who stand under the basket with those big mops, like they're working in a school cleaning up, like in the breakfast club. And they're sort of sweeping the floor and they're trying to clean the sweat. There always used to be one guy, do you know this, for Nick games, there was one guy under each basket. He was the Patrick Ewing sweeper because Ewing would be on the free throw line. And while he would take his armband and rub under his chin and his forehead in sort of the same OCD way that Nadal picks his ass, there was a guy who comes and sweeps right after the free throw, right at the free throw line as the action's going the other way. So I don't know if this prom game had sweepers, didn't have sweepers. All I know is if I'm the president of a team like the Thunder and I see that my guy got hurt doing this, I am absolutely pissed off and here's why. I haven't had a chance. I only drafted Chet, right? It's not like he's a fourth year player. It's not like I've lived with him. It's not like I've learned about how his body reacts to certain injuries. It's not like I've learned how his body recovers. I haven't learned enough about his nutrition, his work ethic. I've done the homework to draft him, but until you live with someone, you don't know them well enough. So I don't know whether he's just gonna get out of bed, roll out of bed after a six pack and go play in a game. I don't know if he's a Mormon, doesn't drink, doesn't kill, and gets out of bed, stretches for an hour, and then plays at 50% capacity, trying to protect himself for the season. I just don't know these things. So rookies, especially the way I operate, is they get the good rookies, right, who we are projecting to be good. Their leash is always the smallest. The leashes that I offer, the larger leashes, that's an unfortunate expression because I'm certainly not saying that they're dogs, but I think that's an expression. I think I'm overthinking this, Coco, but the, the, the freedom, that's another bad one. What's the word when you allow an employee to do something that you only allow once you know? Like when your kid shows they're responsible. Yes, you may keep the remote control to the TV or you may have your iPad while we're out to dinner because I've learned that you'll still go to bed on time and you're not the kind of kid who will keep it on all night. The trust, that's a good one, Coca. I like that. I have no ability to trust a player who we just drafted. Don't know him well enough. You gotta build trust. It takes a lifetime 
to build trust and one pro-am game to ruin it. So you're asking me if I would have let Chet Holmgren play in that game? The answer is a hard, not a soft, a hard no. Now, he may not be out for a long time, but he may be. I guess we'll have to wait to see. You think LeBron James feels badly? I don't think he views the Thunder as a competitive team for him this season. Although, frankly, every team should be. Nah, they got Patrick Beverly. They're going to be fine. What do you think of my new rule in baseball? I don't think players should be allowed to have surgery while they're on the suspended list. I'm going to be sending a formal, dramatic memo to baseball that's going to go right in the circular file. Wait, who's that guy? Did that guy used to run a team like a million years ago? Yeah, that was that. Oh, God. No. Garbage. Dear sirs and one madam. <laughs> I would like to suggest as part of the next collective bargaining agreement that when a player tests positive for steroids, you're allowed to make his contract not guaranteed. In the alternative, if you're not willing to fight for that, any player test positive for any sort of PED, any sort of any spray, clear, cloudy, cream, syringe, in the ass, anything. They are not allowed to rehab or do anything else to help improve an existing injury. Fernando Tatis, after all these years of playing with a bad shoulder, missing games all the time, worrying about should he play shortstop, should we move him to the outfield? Fernando Tatis is suspended for 80 games right now for trying to fix ringworm with steroids, which he now admitted, of course, he didn't have ringworm. You know that Tatis story, I don't need to get into it again. But I have a very simple question. Do you think it's fair that he gets to have shoulder surgery now? And that the Padres get to have him rehab his shoulder surgery and he doesn't miss any extra games? And if he had had the shoulder surgery, he'd miss the same number of games, roughly, as what he's missing for suspension? Have you ever heard of concurrent versus consecutive sentences? That's something that happens in criminal law. Have you ever read that? I love this. He murdered five people. He was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences. Well, what does that mean? That means when you die, you're done with your first life sentence. You've got four to go. Do you get pardoned for the other four when you've already died after one? I don't quite know how that works. How do you serve your second life sentence? Oh, I, oh of course, right? If you believe in the afterlife, then they go there. Our criminal justice system goes there and kills you in the afterlife. And that's two. Maybe there's five levels of afterlives. But by six, you're a free man. Concurrent is good. I like that. Four concurrent life sentences. That means for all the people that I killed, I get to just get it all out of the way. There's a trial going on right now in, uh, in Florida for the shooter in Parkland. And I've always had a hard time in law school this is not on the rundown, Coca, but this is in my head right now. I've always had a hard time with the following. When someone is convicted or pleads guilty, and then there's the penalty phase where you figure out what's going to happen, and it's a state that has the death penalty, and you've got an entire trial trying to figure out whether the person's going to get a life sentence or capital punishment. And there's often a jury who decides. And then you've got the lawyer who represents the convicted felon, murderer, rapist, whoever, whatever, whichever, stands up there and says, yeah, my guy pulled out a gun. My guy shot up a school, but I'm telling you, I think it should be a life sentence. I think it should be in prison for life. So I have a few thoughts on this. I am definitely would like you to think about capital punishment the way it is now it is quite ineffective the reality is there are people on death row who can appeal it can be 10 15 18 years and the state is spending millions of dollars dealing with appeals and habeas corpus briefs and all the other things that happen in death penalty case but when someone's in prison that's also they have to be paid for right 
life versus it's not just the nine years of appeals. If a guy's 25 years old, he could be there for 50 years. Which is worse? This is what I think about. What would be the bigger punishment, would you say? If you had to think about what you would rather, would you rather die or would you rather be in prison for 50 years? I guess that's a personal decision. Let me tell you where I stand. I can't even imagine being in prison for 50 years. I think that's a far worse punishment. Now, some people like it, right? Because you get three square meals a day. You have structure. You don't have to worry about anything other than, you know, soap on a rope and various other shanks, etc. But you sort of get into a routine. You do your thing. Is that a big enough punishment? I think, what about, what about death by a thousand cuts for people who do school shootings? What about that? Letting them bleed out with no one helping. I don't know why I was even talking about that. Oh, we were talking about Tatis. How did I even get on the subject of what happened in Parkland? I don't know. So Tatis gets to have shoulder surgery. The Padres are thrilled. Isn't that amazing? It really pisses me off. Tatis went to uh, visit his teammates yesterday. It was pretty good. He called on all his teammates. He went to have a meeting and he said, I'm so sorry. And then he met the media. He did a scrum in the dugout. He's allowed to be there before the game starts. Then he has to leave. That's generally the rules of suspension. If I'm the Padres, I don't want him anywhere near except for the day that he's being punished. Uh, the day that he's talking to the, to, the, to the teammates and to the media. Now I, I want him out of here. Don't even be around. But he said to his teammates, listen, I did badly. And he did a whole mea culpa. He finally got the right advice. But he had plenty of time after testing positive, before deciding what to say publicly. He had plenty of time to decide what to say. And the best he could come up with was ringworm. And now he says he's an embarrassment and he's going to work his... Everyone says that when they get caught, right? I'm now going to work to rebuild the trust and to show you that I'm a good guy. When we come back, I'm going to review a movie that I guarantee you not one of you have seen. I actually went to a theater to watch this movie. And we're also going to talk about what happened in Los Angeles yesterday on August 24th. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name's David Sampson. Thank you. You found us. You rate, you review, you follow. Get on YouTube at Nothing Personal with David Sampson. There's no reason not to hit subscribe. I think the whole thing is to get more subscribers, so do that. More followers, Twitter. We have a TikTok page. I know it's too much to do. We're supposed to promote just one thing a day, so okay. Today we'll do um, TikTok, nothingpersonal.npds. Coca puts one out every day. We do only original content, and it's fun because Coca's good at it. Still watch a movie every day. It is getting to be later in the year. We're in the second half of the year. I'm beginning to think about Oscars. I generally don't go to the theaters until its Oscar nominations have come out. But there is one theater that I really like because Billy Joel refurbished it and it burnt to the ground. It's a theater in Sag Harbor, New York. And I enjoy going there because it's sort of historic and there's always a chance you're gonna see Billy Joel. And I've never seen Billy Joel there, but there's always the chance. So I went there because there's this documentary that I heard is an award-winning documentary and has a chance to be nominated for an Oscar. So I figured, let me get that out of the way. Let me see it. It's called Fire of Love. Fire of Love is a story about two volcanoologists. I never heard of that before. A volcanoologist is someone who studies volcanoes. Volcanoes are do you know the difference between magma and lava, right? Do you? Yeah, nor do I. Do you know that you can have volcanoes that are two tectonic plates coming together and causes like a thing when you push two hard things together and then something's got to give and then they both give and then boom, something happens. Or when tectonic plates are pulling apart, that causes like stuff that's underground to come out. It's, it's a lot of Ghostbusters stuff, right? There's a lot of red stuff bubbling. Did you know red volcanoes? Like when you see a volcano erupting and it's red, that means red is good, gray is bad. 
Like gray smoke out of a volcano means you're gonna die. Red lava means, hey, it's just hot. You could fry some eggs. So this documentary is about two people named Katya and, and uh, not Miranda. I wrote Katya and Miranda. That, it's Maurice. These are two people who met in Europe. They lived really near each other. They didn't know each other. Then they both be became volcanoologists. And then they spent the rest of their life, no kids, by the way, not a terrible decision, no kids, no nothing. And they just traveled chasing volcanoes. I'm talking like Helen Hunt, James Paxton type of stuff, right? They're just chasing volcanoes. And then they go and they stay in a tent right on the edge of the lava field and they take unbelievable photos, great video. And then they write books and teach people about the dangers of volcano eruptions. Now, this is sort of a free solo type of thing because eventually when you do what they do, you're gonna croak doing it. You're gonna get eaten by a volcano. You're gonna get disintegrated by an eruption. It's just what, what's gonna happen, right? It's like climbing the face of a mountain with that nothing but chalk, right? It's cool until you're flying through the air with the greatest of ease, with nothing to stop you but the ground below. So you learn early on in this documentary that this love story ends with them being extinguished at a Japanese volcanic eruption. And I'm thinking to myself, this is so depressing because we're watching their home videos. The, the footage, the coverage, the pictures are so phenomenal that you're in a trance watching it. It's, it's forget the fact that it's high definition. You're seeing things up close that you just don't see because no one wants to take pictures of it from so close because the odds are you're going to get extinguished. And then Maurice in French, it's all in French, but there's uh, subtitles. He says, oh, I know I'm gonna die, but isn't it great to live a short, phenomenal life and die young than to live forever and do nothing? True, but I'd rather go with E, right? What's my other option? How about living a long life and doing a lot of stuff? Cool stuff. That's what I'm going for. I think there's a way you can do that, right? There's a chance you're gonna die in Kilimanjaro, but the odds are in your favor. There's a chance you're gonna die on 95 driving to Miami or on the LIE, but it seems like you won't. Fire of Love is one of the most intense, beautiful, mesmerizing, documentaries I have ever seen. And the way the producers and writers did it, they have a narrator. There's no interviews. It's not like they speak to, oh, the third cousin of Maurice misses him greatly and is taking care of his estate. Like there's none of that. It's interviews with them that they filmed of themselves when they were actually in the volcanoes or looking at the volcanoes. And the narrator, is a woman I never heard of. Coke, I believe her name is Miranda July. I don't think that's right. Is there a woman named Miranda July who's an actress and a narrator? Her voice is so soothing and so wonderful. Her cadence, it, it, it doesn't do anything but make you feel like I'm so present in this moment and I'm okay with how this movie ends because I'm allowed to enjoy the process. And Miranda July, thank you, Coca. So I would like to suggest that any and all of you watch this documentary called Fire of Love. And I'm gonna give you a wait to see. Wait to see is when I tell you something's gonna happen. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But either way, I will revisit it. Not like all the other people out there in the media who never tell you when their takes are wrong. Fire of Love will be nominated for best documentary feature come Oscar nominations. Oscar nominations, I assume, come out. I used to have the day in my calendar. I, I put that day in my calendar. That's a little weird, I grant you, but I love, as you know, I love the Academy Awards. So if I search like nomination in your calendar, Academy Award, by the way, here it is. February 8th of 2020, oh, that's 22. So I don't know when the nominations are for 23. I haven't put in the calendar yet. 
but Fire of Love will be nominated. So I want to talk about what happened yesterday in Los Angeles, and I want to explain why I feel what I feel about this and have you not think that this is me saying that I don't miss Kobe Bryant or I'm not sad that Kobe Bryant died tragically. I'm quite familiar with tragedy in this regard in plane crashes, et cetera. And uh, what happened to Kobe Bryant, there's no other way to say it. It's a straight tragedy. Uh, it is a emotional tragedy for his wife, Vanessa, and their children, losing a father and a sister, a husband and a daughter. There is no way to sugarcoat it. There is nothing worse in the world, and I cannot step in these shoes. There has to be nothing worse than losing a child. I can't think of anything in any age. Doesn't matter, right? For my mother with my sister, right? There's nothing worse ever. A spouse, a parent, no. Losing a child is the number one. I think everyone can agree on that. Even if you don't have children. Sometimes when accidents happen, you can allocate blame. There are lawsuits that happen. Vanessa Bryant has sued the helicopter company that owned the helicopter. She has sued the pilot who also died trying to get money there. And I get it. I understand that our legal system does that. It allows people to be compensated for their pain. It is a very complicated process to prove what your pain is and how to assign a dollar amount. We saw it with the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, right? We saw that. You see it when there's pain and suffering with people where there's death, right? I do not have the ability to be with my spouse. I cannot have sexual relations with my spouse because you ran him over and now he's alive, but he can't walk and he can't have sex, right? Okay, that's worth $2 million. Clearly not Jewish. When a Jewish man can't have sex, I think the total value is probably $14.69. And if you know, you know. If you don't, you know. So I understand why that's our system. And in many ways, going through law school and, and speaking to lawyers, as I have for the last many decades, lawyers who make a living trying to assign an amount of money to the law, to loss, to loss of life, cohabitation is the word I was thinking of. It is a, it's a game. And the lawyers all say they're taking it very seriously, and they do, but they're taking it seriously because of the money involved and the fees they get. You're trying to get a jury to agree that what you've been through is so horrible, the only way you can make it better, because we can't bring back the person who died, but the only way we'll make it better, we'll make it feel a little better, we'll give you millions of dollars. You feel better now? Well, I want the millions of dollars because if my were it to be that my spouse were alive, my spouse would have been working hard and would have made $50 million. And now I don't have the $50 million. So I want the $50 million. I want replacement income. Now, of course, that's what life insurance is for. Who knows when people die? Some people have it, some people don't. So Kobe Bryant dies and people from the sheriff's department and the fire department are on site dealing with this tragic accident and they're taking photos. Vanessa Bryan has alleged that they were sharing these photos inappropriately with people within the departments and that caused her emotional trauma. And there's a chance that these photos are going to go public and that would be devastating to her family. So she sued the sheriff's department and the fire department saying what they did is not just inappropriate, but it's basically made it so that she has a level of damage that requires compensation. Now remember, she's not suing the sheriff's department and the fire department because of his death. This is not about replacing his income. This is not a product's liability suit. This is a suit where she is alleging emotional trauma, worrying that one day she will see pictures of her husband and daughter on 
Google. Lawyers for the other side said it was inappropriate what they did. We'll grant you that. But these pictures have never been made public. They should have been obviously more discreet. We've put things in place to make it more discreet. But the end of the day is we got to take photos because there's investigations. So that's our job. And so the lawyers for the sheriffs and the fire department had the uncomfortable position of having to argue that Vanessa Bryan shouldn't get money, but they tried to make it so you weren't thinking about that it was Kobe Bryant's widow. You were thinking about it as though it were a legal case. And that's a smart way to go when you're a lawyer. It's smart to say, hey, this is about photographs and about whether or not anyone can prove that the possibility of a photograph. Remember the uh, TV show we watched, uh, The Most Hated Man on the Internet, who put revenge porn on the, on the web, and these women were trying to get it taken down because they turned on the web and there they were? You don't get to get a picture taken down that's never been up, right? I know you've got a picture of me when you break up with your boyfriend. I want that picture back. I'm worried that you're going to post that picture on the internet and everyone's going to see my body. Therefore, take it down, delete it. Well, it's not up yet. What are your damages? I get that legal argument. That legal argument is dispositive for me but it's a no-win situation for the Sheriff's Department and the Fire Department. And a jury awarded Vanessa Bryant $16 million. She wanted way more. She wanted, let's say $50 million, but she got $16 million. And guess who's paying for it? Yeah, the citizens of Los Angeles. It's not like the Sheriff's and the Fire Department are gonna do like a bake sale on the sidewalk to raise $16 million. I'm not even sure whether they'll appeal because it's such an emotionally charged lawsuit. But if I'm them, if I am them, I have to appeal. I can't allow myself to be open to liability every time I'm taking pictures at a crime scene or an accident. Famous people or not famous people. This is now a precedent. Vanessa Bryant is not getting money because it's Kobe Bryant's photo. She got money because the jury said, we cannot have anyone worried about any pictures being disseminated publicly. How do you stop that? Or do you say, oh, it's only because Kobe's famous? And then if it's just an ordinary schnook, who's gonna wanna post those? Who's gonna wanna show those around? People are showing these photos for the the nature of the photos. When it's someone who's better known, there's more of an appetite to show them, I guess. But I think it's fair to say, no matter who it was, we all have that macabre sense. Some people turn their heads, some people don't. It's like when you see a car crash. So I completely disagree with the verdict. I disagree with the award. And how do you calculate the husband of someone else who died on the helicopter and the father, there was a wife and daughter who died, right? And this guy is a, lost his wife and daughter. He got 15 million, she got 16 million. Maybe because Kobe's more famous? I don't know, I find it all to be disappointing, which doesn't change the fact that it is a tragedy beyond words whenever anybody dies in a crash that could have been avoided. All right, corrections. I always make corrections. I say things wrong. Yesterday, I reviewed a movie about Jane Goodall with her chimpanzees and, and gorillas. And I said the only place to find silverback gorillas are Rwanda, Uganda, and the DNC. No, you cannot find gorillas in the Democratic National Committee. You cannot. You can find them in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you for that correction. That came on Twitter from a listener. Thank you. Nothing personal pick of the day. We had the raise over the twins. We're a winner. We just got to 90 wins. We're 90 and 73. Today, I've got a game for you. The Orioles are playing the White Sox. The White Sox have a pitcher going named Lance Lynn. Lance Lynn is the guy who had a good year, and then the White Sox signed him to an extension, two years, 38 million. He's in the first year of his two-year extension, and this year, he S-T-I-N-K triple S's, which, by the way, the White Sox in general are a struggle bus. The Orioles have faded a little, but they're still very much in contention. 
they could still make the playoffs. I'd like them to. The White Sox are having a hard time catching the Guardians in their division. They certainly are unlikely to secure a wild card spot, but you never know. But we're taking the Orioles over Lance Lynn. I am a Lance Lynn seller, and you should be too. All right, I'm out of this studio, going into the other studio to record two hours. So you got three hours of my dulcet tones today. I'll be back tomorrow with another brand new edition of Nothing Personal. Remember, it's just business. This is Nothing Personal. Mm -hmm.